Okay. The, the camera is funny. And the chaps that came to set it up told me that in there, there's already a microphone set in all of the rooms. Uh -huh. So that when there are lectures and things, students can log in to the network if they've missed a lecture and hear a full transcript of what they missed when they weren't there. Yeah, yeah. Technology for you. So the days when we used to take yeah. notes and things are long gone. Um, we'll, make a, we'll make a start because we're here on time. Um, I'll, tell, I'll just sort of briefly say a little bit about me and what the purpose of all this was, from my understanding. My name is Pauline Watts, Patrick knows me. I've been a social worker for, I think, about 25 years now. Um, and before Southend was unitary, there were a whole lot of us yeah. in Southend, weren't we? Mm -hmm. On Friday, and then we all left on the Friday when it became unitary, and about, I think, 13 people left at once, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Change. Big change. Big change. Yeah. So I've been around a little while and I left statutory um, provision um, almost four years ago now. I've been working as an independent social worker and I do I do some training but I also work with local authorities who have been struggling in Ofsted. So I do that and I work directly with people because I still like practice. I like I still believe that the strength of what we do lies in the quality of our practice and the relationships that we you know, build with our families um, and our clients. So that's me. The whole basis of this little hour was, from my understanding, the first part of beginning to work towards, at some point, for those of you who want to, um, some master's credits down at the end of all of that. And in between, there was going to be some online learning, I think, as well, that they're going to put together. So, did you get that little overview that was, should I hope, have been sent out to you? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Yes? Yes? All I did was just a couple of sides. Oh, is it no? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, did you send, I didn't send that, no. I think there was a link, wasn't there? No, yeah, that's the one you sent out. That's the link. Yeah. Yeah. Picking that up as well. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll come back. Tell me first of all, welcome, who are, who are you and where do you belong? I'm Angela, I'm a social worker at Southend and in the fostering team. Fostering, okay, excellent. Uh, my name is Susanna. Um, it's a community drug and alcohol substance misuse. Okay. It's West Indian. just moved now. Okay. Are you in South End, Bryce? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then Patrick Callahan, I'm the team manager of Children with Disabilities. Oh, is that where you are? Yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent. Been there Patrick. for the last um, 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. Patrick and I go way back, as you think. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh. Excuse me, I yep. thought I'd turn that down. Oh, sorry, I have to take this one. It's a Excuse me, sorry about that. Hello, what's happened? Hello. Okay. Perhaps not the best start to be talking yeah, no. about. <laughs> 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 but it all interrupts you, Marie. I'm going to introduce myself, but I need to come back. Yeah. I'm Shirley Mason. I work for the learning disability team, adults learning disability team, I'm a social worker there. Okay, welcome then. And as I just said, as you went out the door, perhaps not the best thing to have your phone ringing as we're about to talk that's, about. That's somebody's, it's, it's all related. Um, Supervision. It's a kind of a, I'm sorry, I just know there's issues. Don't usually do this. <laughs> Pick up, it's all right, I'll catch up. I'll be there. Okay. Okay. Oh. There we 
there is something about Sid Vision. Oh, well, are you? Oh, well, come in. So Joy, tell me your name. It's Thelma. Thelma Henry Brown. Hi, Thelma. Come in. Squeeze yes. somewhere, wherever you like. You can come and sit here at the front. It's, it's okay. no, big, no big deal about where we're sitting. <laughs> Just somewhere that I can see all you. There's only a few of us here. My name's Pauline Watts. Okay. And we're going to, the whole purpose of this is to start thinking about supervision. So, I set you guys, if you received the little handout, the overview. I did receive it. I did receive it. Uh, did you read, read it? it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the tasks were, and we can do a little bit of thinking while we're here, because that's okay as well. The first task really was, um, what are your experiences of good supervision? Okay, what does it look like? What does good supervision look like? Time to be spread. Yeah. Yes, uh, have a bit of uh, me time, a bit of your own time. You know? Yeah. And look at the personal development training. No interruptions. No interruptions. Mm. Including phones. Yeah. <laughs> We're just laughing because the person that should be in here is out there on the phone. Um, I'm going to find another pen. Let's try that one. Okay. No interruptions, yeah. What are the features of good supervision? That was part of the question. What the, what the, when you've had good supervision? I, I think it's what, what gets you thinking, looking at it in a different perspective. It's just offering something that you can work with in your cases. Mm. Analysis. So the feelings, mm. your supervisor, mm. who else is a supervisor? Okay. What do you want your supervisees to be feeling? Supported. Supported. Suppose being able to express all the difficulties because that's what it says. So when they come to you, that they can be open. Yeah, it needs to be a safe environment for them as well. Describe safe, Patrick. Well, to critically analyse what it is that they're they're doing their own work, their case loads, and not being afraid to to look at it areas where maybe they could have done things better without feeling too criticised for it, you know. Um, critical friend. Yeah? Yeah. Someone that could kind of... Mum Lowe talks about that and says, you know, good supervision 
should enable you to be able to take that step back and to look at things with a different perspective. It should be able to help you to say, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I missed that. Because part of one of the things that she talks about, Mumbo's maxim, that apply, I mean, she talks about in child protection, but it applies in practice generally, I believe, is the most effective tool in child protection is her parenthesis. The most effective tool is to admit you might have made a mistake. Mm. You know, we're not perfect. Mm. The jobs <laughs> that any of us do involves working with people. So by their very nature, people are unpredictable. I so suppose that's, that's a cultural thing also, because following Baby D and, and, and other um, big inquiries where people were really on the back foot and people were not very willing to come forward and, and put themselves up and say, actually, I might have made a mistake or I might have done it wrong. Um, okay, so do you think there's a cultural blame generally? Mm -hmm. Does that extend, bear in mind, we're just here, does that extend in South End? I think it's better now. I think it's better, but there, there definitely was going back not that many years ago, there was a, a very much a blame culture, but I think certainly we've got new management structures and I think it's, it is better. Do you guys agree that it feels better? You don't have to agree. Um, my, I, I didn't actually, I've never really felt in my supervisions that there, were blame, there was a blame culture. It's strange, but I have not. I, I think maybe, that. sorry, Shirley, I think maybe more in children's services than there was in adults. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think the culturally bit is the you know, children's social care, broadly, I think you're right. And we still continue to pick up the fallout from successive child death inquiries. You know, Peter Connolly was just one very public, but there have been quite a few since then. But haven't still quite made it as, as famous as he has. Okay, that's what good supervision looks like. Anything else we want to add to that? We might come back to that. Because the next question on that list then was about be prepared to think about what happens when supervision goes wrong. What does this goes wrong? Are we talking about bad supervision? Why is that, Patrick? What is one of the factors? Um, it certainly, re again, it goes back to that name culture a bit, but I think if your supervision is annoying, the, the nature of the work that we do is, is so vital. And very often, when you're certainly when you're working in child protection, some of those decisions that you have to make, um, you really have to get it right. You really have to, you know, the consequences of not getting it right are, are, are can be huge. Adult services, only recently, the guy who killed, raped and, I think, did it raped and killed a child? Or, but well, certainly raped that girl. Was he previously known to adult social care? And there was one who was let out, I think, who had mental health problems. So I think there is a, there is around the nature of risk in adults safeguarding aspects as well as in children mm -hmm. because adults are beginning to catch up adult services with the nature of what it feels like to be blamed when things yeah. go wrong yeah. so it's yeah there is that there was the, you're a bit time lag delay perhaps but there is a sense that some of that begins to catch up on you guys so it increases risk okay what else is it like when things go wrong That you're not competent enough. You're not competent enough. What is going on? So, do you feel not competent yes. enough? I think it increases your uncertainty, yeah. doesn't it? This kind of season. Are you working with your child? Yeah. 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 
Led by the supervisor. Mm. And not enough time given to that rush. Because mm. they're not overly interested, not peering, not overly interested. <laughs> Just monitoring as well. Hang on, I'll have to turn back to you. What was that last? Monitoring. Just monitoring. Somebody comes to the door, people yeah. phone you up, people sit on the computer. How do you do supervision, supervisors? We do it in my office, close, with the engage sign on it, and not to be interrupted unless it's a matter of life and death. Okay. That's it. Do you have a computer on? And are you writing on the computer at the same time? Sometimes. Sometimes. No, no, I do tend to. So I had an observation on for a course that I was doing, and one of the things that was highlighted was I said, I spend so much time with my back to the supervisee that there is a certain time that you need to do stuff like that, but the majority of the time it's, it's, it's done face to face. It is difficult. There is, um, I don't know what system your ICS uses. Okay, of course. Oh, it's care first, okay. Um, I'm quite familiar with Liquid Logic that has all the forms ready to go. Has yours got forms ready to go? Okay. So there is a tendency in the course of supervision for people to say, hey, tell me about that case, just while I'm typing out there. Okay, what were the details? And I mean, I'm deaf. I was born partly deaf. I cannot abide people to have their back to me. A, because I can't lip read, and I really rely a lot on lip reading. And B, it's just bloody bad manners, truthfully. And if we're talking about <coughs> reflective supervision, you can't do reflective supervision, I don't believe, if your back is to somebody. Because part of reflective is engaging with people. And to engage, you need to have a modicum of reasonable eye contact so that people feel <laughs> appreciated and cared for and valued and all the stuff we've just talked about on that first sheet of paper. Okay, so what do you think, are there risks to clients when things aren't working like that? Are there risks for our vulnerable adults and children? And if so, what might they be? But the risks are not giving given enough um, credence, not giving enough um, attention, enough analysis. Um, it does it. I think it increases the risk. What about outcomes? Does your supervision talk about outcomes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. Okay, that's really good. Yeah. Not everyone starts. It does now. This new this new model that they brought in the South End has this what's the story? You know, what, what, what does it look like? There is actually five different elements to it that they have, but outcomes is one of those. It's a good thing. Because A Ofsted like it, but hey, that's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. You know, what is important is that we can as managers understand and get practitioners to explain what do they want to achieve? What, what was the purpose of being involved with this family or this adult? Then there has to be some purpose. And you have to have a desired outcome to the end of all that intervention. Otherwise, we're just doing to people all the time without thinking about the future. So outcomes is good. What else is on your supervision then now? Um, there's a lot, I mean, we concentrate a lot on, on analysis now. Okay, so is there a separate analysis section? Yes. 
we have the, the first bit is around discussion, what is discussed, or, or certainly what I would want discussed, or whatever the member of staff wants discussed. Um, then there are issues around safeguarding and analysis, the work that's been undertaken, any concerns that they have, any risks that they have. And then there's an action plan at the end of it, okay. um, which gives the, some sort of direction to the worker as to what the next steps okay. should be. Two things. Firstly, has adult services, what, is that the same format? That's what I was trying to work out. Um, you know, I'm sort of relating to quite a bit of what Patrick's just said. And um, certainly we've got an, app, uh, uh, an action box at the end, which I think that's the same as, as outcome. And we've got another, I mean, we've got a client box and then we've got a, a box where we basically say what's going on. And yes, there is an action box and there's a, almost a, like a time scale box. So I suppose it's the same, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Okay, your actions then, are they smart? So you've got time scans? <coughs> yes. Okay, yeah. and are they followed through? Well, mm. with every super, I mean, the way that they've designed it now is that we, the, the, the member staff picks three cases, and I pick three cases that we discuss in supervision. And that's sort of rolling, so that every three months, each case will have been discussed by, by at least uh, once every three months. Excellent. Um, so that it, and it, it allows for more intense discussion rather than skimming over cases. Yeah. No, good thing. Um, part of the discussion I had this morning in Thorock was that they were saying um, they had to look at every case every month. And it's becoming harder to do that. And if that's the road that you go down, then you can't possibly look at all the cases in the sort of detail that you need to. And one of the things that we were talking about there was, in some areas now, um, and I, I don't know your, I, I bet it doesn't say in your supervision policy, you have to look at every case, every, every session. I'm, I'm sure it will say supervision should be monthly lasted in a duration of an hour and a half, etc., something like that. But um, in some areas where I've been working, they've been they've moved to that model of all cases being seen in a three-month cycle, but particularly in children's social care, the child protection ones and the ones in proceedings are looked <coughs> at every month. Mm. So that you have some up-to-date, because the whole one of the things about planning is that there's a lot of evidence to say they drift and that the CP plans and in fact lack aren't very well maintained. So there is an argument for doing those regularly. But the others are. But what, what people are doing for is themes. So they're looking at common themes in cases and using those in supervision, agreeing the themes they want to explore next Wednesday at half past one. These are the ones, and the themes are around parents who use substances and neglect. So let's think about the half a dozen cases that Patrick's got, and we'll talk about it. So that's the kind of practice that lots of places are beginning to kind of use a model where what we know is. If you can spend time doing some reflection and some good quality analysis, then you can apply that to lots of cases. You can apply the learning across different cases. You're not just held into your task-focused activities for the blogs family. Um, because the danger in that, as you folk probably know, is sometimes practitioners will go away and only hold the blogs family in their head. Whereas, once we get people to start saying, well, this is the blogs family, that's the Evans family, that's the White family, let's look at the common threads between that and how we might manage and think about that. So that's the way forward in relation to that. It enables you to use resources greater as well. I mean, we have a number of parents who, who uh, children with autism uh, where one of the common themes that we come across is sleep deprivation. 
um, and, and that has become a common theme. So the needs within the family were increasing, it's affecting the siblings, school performance, um, everything else, outcomes, positive outcomes. So we were able to redirect some resources into managing the sleep deprivation in order to alleviate that. But that was one of the themes that came out of that sort of analytical discussion and supervision. And the part, you're right, because what we can do as an agency then is to use our ever decreasing resources much more effectively. And it, it must be the same in adults. I mean, I can't imagine for any that your resources have increased. Yeah, well, we've even got less in adults than children, yeah. And, you know, historically, adult services have been seen as like a poor relation, you know, when it has been considered that children's services get a lot more, you know, I've, there are arguments too off, off, you know, against that in many circumstances, but I think there is some little bits of truth around any of those sorts of arguments. Um, so for, for you guys, you know, the focus in adults then, how do, how do you, when you're in supervision, how does that work for you? Because you're working with adults with sub substance. substance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how's that? Because the risks are high. Yeah. And they're in the same way they're high around mm. child, child protection. So what 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 is the focus? What drives that? Um. Um. My feels like every once in a month, um, my supervisor. Uh, pick three of my cases randomly. The one that is on high risk and ask me a question like, oh, what are we doing to address this issue now? Because most, um, once a month we always have this serious case with me, like someone that overdoes alcohol or drug, you know. So now it's a big issue now, it's suddenly because of the cost with the housing benefit, mm -hmm. and most of our clients now are homeless. So um, once they are homeless, there's a risk of them drinking more, mm -hmm. taking drugs more, and there's a risk of them not engaging with the services. So, so what we are doing now is um, once we um, find out which client is at risk, bring it to the supervision and try and put their case for to panel for rehabilitation where they can go for 12 weeks. So risk management, mm -hmm. well risk identification and risk management is a key mm -hmm. and probably the most foremost part mm -hmm. of your work. Mm -hmm. Whereas, what team are you in? Mental health. Mental health. <coughs> Fostering. Fostering. CWD. Oh. Oh. Learning this. Okay, so it will vary across those teams around the degree of risk that you might be talking about in supervision. So, how do you use your supervision? Is that do you use it slightly differently? Um, we have a tool. Okay. Yeah, we have a tool. Um, so I do professional supervision, but we also supervise a smaller team. So we, um, when we look at cases, um, we'd be looking at actually the clinical side in regards to medication, and as well as the, um, the 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 care that's social provided side. social side, and um, looking we always look at outcomes. What do you want to achieve for okay. this person? and how long has it been under the team, okay, what have you done, what do we okay. need to do, and how do we get him uh, to a point where, does, where is it, because obviously some of them will remain unwell, but we don't want the man to our services because we've done that piece of work. Do you so. think that some areas, I'm thinking now, just to kind of trigger say, are better at identifying outcomes? Because you, you're outcome focused, yeah. aren't you? Fostering isn't outcome focused, is it? Drug and alcohol, I think, is probably outcome focused. CWD? A mixture of both, really. A mixture of both. Yeah, yeah no, a mixture of both. We do a mixture of both. So we look at the outcomes as well. <coughs> uh, it's very much about, we put services to try and reduce 
vulnerabilities and risks. But we also look at trying to, um, when we do our assessment, we look at what the individual wants to do, because it's very much person-centered, discussing mm -hmm. things with the individual, and look at what the individual wants at the end of it all. So you put a plan in place, and you look at how, when you review it, you look at what they've achieved or not. Supervision with foster carers. Um, it's about making sure foster carers are um, supported. So my supervision with the social workers is about how the foster carers are managing the children, any ideas and sort of techniques we've got to help them with that. So again, it's identifying there is an element of risk if the carers aren't, aren't managing. Yeah. Um, and the same when we do assessments of foster care for people who want to be foster yeah. carers. Um, has everything been checked through? And if there's anything that's kind of Sometimes it's just we're not sure what they're meaning or how they say it. Sometimes it's just an opportunity to discuss what's been said in the last um, assessment process. It's like, well, I'm not sure about that. Is there another way of asking that question? Or what, um, there's something here that's not, that doesn't feel right. So it's a case of being able to talk, tease it out and know well, what's not feeling quite right about that. Okay. And has that changed over time? I really started them, okay. so I don't know. Really. Because it sounds to me, I mean, I, I used to be a service manager years ago for Looked After, one of which was fostering. And I think, thinking back a little bit, I don't think that the supervision of, of foster carers sounds as robust. That supervision of, of the social worker, supervision of the foster carers is different. In oh, it is different. That right. we, we just every, every month we meet with them to again, to discuss how they're doing with the, the children. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so it would be an element of reflection, you know, yeah. because if, you, if you use this language, if you talk about using different language, and that kind of thing, it is, it has grown and become more robust, yeah. but it's not as perhaps robust as the supervision of social work, no. which is more reflective. Yeah, and that, that's certainly, I think, changed and incorporated much more, yeah, a reflective style than used to be, in my experience. So that's a good thing, okay. The third thing that we just want to little touch on a little bit before we decide about where we're going. By the way, did anyone manage to get that? Right. That was one of, along with me, that as a good thing to read, okay, which is a sky paper. This is Open University, they're the little pocket books. They're about, I don't know, $6.99 or $7.99. And truly, that is everything. I looked, I found that and I thought, that is just so handy. It's straightforward, it's written by somebody who understands practice, it's got little good practice checklists throughout there, it's got um, things that, you know, how you can make things better, and it's just a simple language, but the, the good practice little boxes are there throughout. And you can just scan them and think, that is useful. So if you're looking to take it forward, that's a good one. That's at the OU, is it? That's the OU Press. Yeah, Open University Press. There. The, oh, I can't see the number. I can pass that round and you can copy the ISBN number. So that's a good one. The other one is David Howe. Professor Howell, University of East Anglia, the Emotionally Intelligent Social Worker. That's a good one. I wouldn't read it cover to cover, mm. but it's good for dipping in and out. It, it starts off and talks about what is emotional intelligence, what are emotions, and it goes on to talk about the emotional brain, emotions and physical health. It brings in obviously supervision and practice. So that's quite a nice sort of one to dip in and out of stuff. And that's the other one, Jane Monacott, who, you know, is one of, along with the late Tony Morrison, they're kind of shared gurus in talking about supervision. And again, this is another really straightforward. There's a good bit in there that she talks about using the supervision cycle. And she says, I talk about this, I talk, supervision cycle, talk about this divided up into three sections about experience, about reflection, and about analysis. And so there are examples of the sorts of questions you might ask and how you might want to tease things out with people. And I found that, again, another interesting and useful and straightforward book. 
So there is loads of stuff in the world around right now. Um, if you pass them back when you finish, and then we can share them along. And the other one was the, that paper, which again was supervision now or never, and it's reclaiming reflective supervision in social work. And this was written by Tony Morrison and Jane Wanacott in February 2010. He was killed, I think, in April. So to yeah. Tony Morrison was killed, I think, in April 2010 in a skiing accident. Mm. So that's a nice, easy little paper. If you just Google um, supervision now or never, you'll find that little paper. It's, I don't know, 10 pages or so. But one of the things that they talk about very much, if you haven't heard about it, is the 4x4x4 four by four by four <coughs> model for supervision. And that talks about, in the centre you've got service users, staff, <coughs> the organisation and partners. Around that you've got experience, reflection, analysis, plans and action. Around the outside, development, mediation, support and management, which are functions of supervision. And that's really great, nice, easy to understand little model for supervision. <coughs> so, the next part then. Quality of supervision impact on your, compa your capacity to do the job. Has it or does it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so do you want to share any examples perhaps? It's the, 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 <coughs> the amount of work that you have to do, the quality of the work that you do. Um, the decisions that you make, the guidance that you get in the decisions that you make, are all impacted by the quality of supervision that you get. Um, I'm, I'm a person who actually, I enjoy supervision. Not everybody does, but I actually enjoy supervision. I get a lot from it. Um, I think it's my, my security net. It's, it's something that gives me something to fall back on. Um, given that I have to make decisions on my feet every day, um, and it gives me some reflective time to have those discussions about whether those decisions were sound decisions, why they were sound decisions, why they were not being so sound. So it helps, helps the me to think through complexities. So, okay. Has there been a time for anyone when your supervision was so poor? Well, I can tell you, I, you know, I've been lucky. I've had generally mostly good supervision, but there was a time um, in one particular job I was supervised by somebody a whom I didn't respect, which was a difficult one. B whom I didn't believe understood the nature of the work and C who simply did not wasn't able to engage and I felt more and more overwhelmed with the work because I wasn't I'm a talker you know I like to share things I like to be able to think about them and did I do that right what happened there oh, I feel like this inside and it left me I, I don't well my old boss had a, had a view about that. I think it contributed to me being ill um, because I was unable to take any of the anxieties anywhere. 
And although I had family stuff going on, and illness myself, that was almost the straw that broke the camel's back. So for me, it made me ill. So has anyone experienced that sort of situation where you feel? Well, um, the, receipt, the receiving which I'm receiving at the moment from my manager, I feel that she really doesn't know what she's helped with. She really, really doesn't know what social work and what we do and how we do it. It's really difficult, although I explain sometimes about some of the things that I think mm -hmm. of when I'm working with someone. Um, and she, she, she uses me as a buffer. So if these things that she wants to develop within the team, she, that's, to her, that's supervision. Well, to me, that's not supervision. No. I'm not gaining anything. I'm just letting her, well, this is what I think. She asks me my opinion about how the team, how something's would impact on the team. And I don't feel that's it's anything to do with my practice and how I want to develop as a senior practitioner. So I, and what I do is I vent. I get quite angry. And I'll go to my other senior practitioner college and just speak with her saying, I've done this and I've done, you know, and you know, she's not giving me anything for me to. So I don't think I'm gaining anything from having supervision with her. And I have requested to have supervision with uh, a social worker. It's there in. Yeah. Our professional technical yeah. abilities framework, I think it is. The only thing I is, this. I get supervision from someone, a consultant social worker, who's not in my area, that does completely different forms of, you know, so in some ways we do relate, but some of the difficulties I have of making decisions about this little small team I have, I need someone from South End to say, where are you going with this? What's, you know, so I feel like I'm in the middle of everything, and, and that's why I think. So I just think and I get cross. And once I've done that, I'm okay, but I'm not achieving anything. No. I and feel. The staff all says, okay, yeah. that we should have, you should have supervision from a qualified registered yeah. social worker. Okay. You may have it elsewhere. One of the things that I do, interestingly, is you know the named and designated nurses for child protection that they have flowing around various places, both in the hospital and out of them. They came, some of them in Essex came to me and I now externally provide safeguarding supervision on a social work model to them because the supervision they have is very much task focused. Should we do this? Should we do that? Have you done that? There's a report for committee. There's a report for, there's a report for that. And I go in every two months and we say, and how's that been for you? It's a whole different ball game. What's been happening for you? How do you feel? What happened when they said that? What about that case? So we talk about cases that come the safeguarding route in health, you know, and the complexity of those. And we talk about the work they do, competing priorities, and the fact that no one asks them those questions. So, yeah, there is a place, quite rightly, because the next bit of that then is so. What do you do? Do you say anything? Yes, you do. Yes, you can speak up. Are you, do you feel though, when you do, that it's somehow your fault? <coughs> that you should just get <coughs> on and do that? I, I don't, I don't feel that, I just, it's how, you know, she just doesn't understand. She, she really, it's very hard. I mean, it's a, it's a really busy team, so it's really difficult to... You're making allowances for her. Yeah, I probably am. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Generous? Yeah. Yeah. Generous? You can make allowances, but if you do, what will change? Nothing. Because it becomes the norm. Yeah. It becomes the norm. Yeah. That's the danger. 
Yeah. You know, I, 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 I like to think that with my team is that they, they do challenge me, like they're encouraged to challenge because yeah. that is their time. Yeah. They're so valuable to them. Um, yeah, and I think one of, one of the best and worst things that happened to me was someone saying to me, can I talk to you about supervision? Yes. I don't think you fully meet my needs. And I was quite beside myself, A, because I'd like to think I'm the sort of person that is um, receptive to people, is that true? Um, and so once I got over me, okay, and could put that where it belonged, it was really useful. And it was more about me being overwhelming as a person, which I know I can be. So it was, you know, once I kind of got that sorted, it was very useful for me, and it was useful for the person, and incredibly brave, because I'm, you know, I'm quite a loud in the face person, and I thought, someone to come and say to me, in my team, you're useless, and not quite like that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But, but you see, I think that that, that is wonderful, because I think that, that that's a culture, that's a culture you need to create, is that the problem is when people, feel they can't challenge because as you say nothing changes and if nothing changes that's where the risks creep in. Absolutely. And that's yeah, yeah, I find that very and then it takes its toll on the worker because the, the jobs we do are so incredibly it takes such a toll on it. It's a baby yield. But that's the, sometimes that's the consequence of, of doing the work we do. You know, when you kind of look at I mean community care online for example often do surveys of staff, you know. And, you know, people with burnout, people leaving the profession, you know, there are a significant number of people of my sort of age and amount of years who have just said enough's enough, you know, for all sorts of reasons, but they've gone. And I think that's quite sad because of the loss of knowledge. Yeah, experience, all of those things that people like me have had that say, you know, I can't do this anymore, I've had enough. So that making me ill is a crucial part. And when you're feeling not okay and not with the game, you can't recognise, I defy you to tell me that you can, you can't recognise those things in other people. So part of the supervisory process is to hold and contain all of those things. I can remember, you know, Jean, which is I was, you know, having supervision of her and talking to her and going da 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 and she said, yeah, okay, now, stop. Where did all that come from? And it was this couple of families that I'd seen one after the other that spill out all of their anxieties and the chaos that they have you know, and you take that around with you. So, you know, I don't, I'm not an advocate of doing two or three assessment visits in the same day because unless you go and have a break, you're taking some of those feelings from one place to another. And the poor person at the end of the day is going to get all the rubbish that you've had, okay? So I remember having this session and, and offloading it all and then, right, so let's start again. How are you feeling? Now I can think about it, okay? Because you need, and if you don't have that facility, yeah, it is, it is unhealthy, unhealthy at the least, dangerous at, at its worst. You know, nobody, manager, practitioner, senior manager, challenged the social workers in, well, I could tell you from Maria Colwyn, Tara Beckford, you know, Jasmine Henry, is it Jasmine? Jasmine Beckford. Jasmine Beckford, Kimberly Carlisle, you know, right down through the lines of history, you know, almost always, plus there's a number of adult serious case reviews, you know, where supervision simply not good enough, no one challenged what was happening. Now, and those are the small things that we can collectively put right. The last thing then that your questions really for you to take away with, which was always kind of going to be the, the purpose of where you go on from here, the 
you are thinking about your e-learning and then if you're going to go on and do those credits uh, for your masters there are a couple of things that you might want to start off thinking about guys know in your respective teams and roles about where the there is at the end of that. But if you're having tricky situations with supervision, you might want to start to think about what can make a difference and how you're going to go about making a change. Do you do peer supervision here? Yeah, but again, it's only just starting out. It's something that we've done at CWD um, for a number of years, but I think in, in mainstream, but it's, it's part of the new social work model. And also the, the uh, professional development, something that every two months will happen with, with staff. Yeah. So. Okay. Adults as well? Mm -hmm. We tend to do peer supervision. But a lot of in our practice meetings we can discuss cases and I suppose to some extent that might be some kind of a peer supervision. Yeah. And you can formalise that. So in some areas of where I've been working, um, they are team meetings. They um, every fortnight they have a business and the other one is purely about practice. So they have some of the things I've been doing from is like a little 10 slide presentation, some handouts about key topics, key stuff that's come from the quality assurance work that I've been doing for, for them. The things around child sexual exploitation, because there are some cases, you know, break in there, child sexual abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, involving children and young people in assessments, working with families where parents are substance and alcohol misuses all those sorts of things, and they do that. And people then, in a couple of cases, they have a PowerPoint presentation and discussion, two hours of real thinking. So again, it's a kind of, let's apply that learning across to different cases. So there are things that are happening, you can do a little Google. The other thing is, if you look at C4EO, which is the website, it's I think it's like it says, by professionals, for professionals, just Google that, and it's a, a, local, a statutory website, C4 are, and they have a whole lot of briefings on there, and some of the things they talk about as well are good practice stuff, so you'll find things around good practice, what's happening elsewhere. So you've got an opportunity to begin you know, the next phase, you're already here, you, you, you six are a little peer group, okay? So you can value and use each other's skill and expertise. You can decide that you want to have an hour lunchtime once a month or once every six weeks to talk about, you know, supporting each other, how it works for you, how you're going to take this forward, what the impact has been in your day-to-day -day experience. There are things that you guys can do. Any offers? Take it away and think about it. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, I think we're in a different place, I think, because we, up until last year, we were managed by education. Oh, yeah. And we were under SEM. We just recently come back into Fearbrook. And, and obviously the pressures within Fearbrook in mainstream is, is far greater than it is in, in our service. So I think we've had the opportunity to, to look at things like this, to look at things like some group supervision and, and set up things in place um, that perhaps are, are a bit more difficult to manage in, in the mainstream. Mm. So I think we've had a bit of an advantage with that. But there's a lot of supervision goes on between discussion in the office 
if you work in the local plan office yeah. and you're having a discussion with colleagues, that's super peaceful. Yeah. You know, it's just not recorded as yeah. such. It's informal. You know, it's, it, yeah, exactly. And I, I think one of the criticisms probably is if you have those sorts of discussions with managers, how that gets lost, that management oversight yeah. is somehow lost. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of retrospective audits of, of, of cases and of cases where there's been difficulties and it is really hard to track the story down. If there's one thing you guys do, put signposts in the case notes of the cases that you're involved in because they're electronic that says that you've had a meeting or that you've had supervision or that you've been to court or that you're thinking of taking some action and just say that can be located in whatever section because one of the one of the big things is we can't track for us for my my own it's children's stories their narrative but i don't believe you could do the same for adults i bet it would still be a struggle mm -hmm. to track and to understand the adult story as you go through that so i, I you know maybe i'm wrong but i bet it's not dissimilar so those are things about thinking, if you're going to have that informal discussion, put it in there. It tracks the story, it tells the part, it's part of the narrative, the child or the adult that you're involved And on that note, my time endeth with you, I'm afraid. It was just disappeared. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I, I, Love coming here. I had a, a moment's 